I love standing between you guys and lunch. That's awesome. So <laughs> um, I, I've already got the, the warnings flying, so hopefully I, I don't go too long. Um, so in case you're like, who the heck am I, right? This is my second DevOps days. I, I did attend last year, and I really loved it. So I'm, I'm really excited that they actually brought me back to do a talk. Um, so who the heck am I? My name is Angela Dugan. Um, I'm kind of all over Twitter and conferences, and I sp oh, thank you. <laughs> So I tend to speak at a lot of local events. Um, some personal things about me that you may know if you follow me on Twitter is I love Halloween. Um, I have chickens. <laughs> yes, I live in Oak Park and we raise chickens. Uh, and I have an awesome husband who supports me. Um, now this talk is on imposter syndrome and the reason I bring that up is because like, you look at the bottom, right? And you see all these things that I do, right? So I'm a Microsoft MVP, I've got all these certifications. So you would think that I was like, hey, I'm a pretty smart person. Right, like look at all this stuff that I've done, look at all these cool things that I do. Okay. <laughs> but this is not necessarily how I see myself. Right, so, so how many people, how many people in the room have at least heard of imposter syndrome and maybe you have an idea what it is? So quite a few, good, good, good. There might be, and hopefully there's more by the end of the talk. So I don't necessarily expect everyone to raise their hand for this. How many people are willing to admit that this is something they definitely feel? Not quite all the same hands, but that's okay, right? And, and honestly, that's actually more than I usually get when I do this talk, which makes me really happy that people are, there, there's not as big of a stigma around it as I think there, there used to be, and I think part of it is because so many people are starting to talk about it. So again, kind of all this, this stuff, right? And I think about like, who do I feel like most days, right? And it's, it's more like this, right? I feel like, I feel like this person. I feel like kind of a phony. Like somehow all those certifications and all those things that I do are just kind of a mask to hide how I really feel about, about who I am and, and what I know and what I contribute. And I used to work at Microsoft, and as you can imagine, working at a place like that can be pretty daunting, right? You literally work with some of the smartest people on the planet. Um, and I remember I'd been there for probably four or five years, and I worked with someone named Scott Hanselman. Not everyone's gonna know who that is. Um, I think he's a little more popular in the dev circles, um, but he's pretty amazing, right? He's one of those people that can get up on a stage, totally own it, he's smart, he's funny, he somehow manages to be cool and work at Microsoft. So he's, he's kind of the, the unicorn, right? <laughs> so I was reading his blog, and I ran across this post and I was like, huh, really? Scott, really? And I started to read through it and essentially someone had written, had written to him and said, hey, you know, I'm having kind of a crisis of conscience here. I feel like I'm stuck. I feel like I can't, I can't push through and kind of make progress in my career and I don't know what to do. And that's when my ears perked up because I was like, dude, that is totally me. And I feel like that describes a lot of people at some point in their career. Maybe not all the time, but certainly at some point. And then he responded, so, so the guy kind of goes through like, here's all my qualifications, right? That laundry list of everything they've done, right? CS degrees and worked at Microsoft and blah, blah, blah. And Scott's response was pretty amazing, right? Like, you're not alone. And I'm like, what, seriously? Like, really? Um, and, and it actually was, was kind of comforting that it wasn't just me, that someone who projects all this charisma and confidence also has those feelings sometimes too. And so, you know, he specifically called out this thing called imposter syndrome, and I got really curious, so I started looking it up. Now, this is not meant to be a psychology talk. I have a CS degree. I don't have a degree in psychology. I'm not an expert on any of these by any means. But I was definitely curious. I wanted to dig into it a little more. And I'd find these websites where they had quizzes, right? You know, all those quizzes you take on the internet, totally legit behavioral science stuff, right? <laughs> totally. <laughs> but, but some of these things really did start to hit home, right? And I started seeing some questions like, you know, hey, when people praise you for things you've accomplished, you're like, oh man, don't say that, because now you're gonna expect me to do better next time, right? Like you're, you're constantly kind of building up this, this image that you have to live up to, right? I'm afraid that, that people are gonna find out that I'm not really as capable as they think I am, right? I rarely do a project or task as well as I'd like to do it, right? This goes beyond perfectionism, but someone this morning used a quote that if I do the longer version of this talk, I often bring up, which is that perfection is the enemy of good, right? Sometimes we get in these 
you know, that they talk about analysis paralysis, and that's part of it. You're so concerned with things being perfect that you spend all this time, you don't really focus on, on just being good. And then comparing yourselves to others, right? That can be really toxic depending on where you're working. Imagine working at a place like Microsoft and constantly comparing yourself to everyone around you. It gets really hard to feel good about yourself and to feel like, like you're really enough. And I feel like that's the word that comes up a lot when you hear about imposter syndrome, is it's feeling like you're not enough somehow. <clears throat> so then I found some even more scientific charts and diagrams from BuzzFeed, but they're pretty amazing. <laughs> and I wanted to share them, because if you're still sitting there going, yeah, I'm not buying this. I, I really don't know that this, this affects me or that this is something that's even relevant to what we do here. But th this is just a few of them that I picked out that I thought were particularly good. Right, so think about when you receive a compliment. What is your immediate response? Right, is it, that's probably someone who's lying to me? <laughs> Or they're just being nice. They have no idea what they're talking about. Like my mom is gonna be like, oh honey, that imposter syndrome talk was so good because she's my mom, right? And, and she does, she does that kind of stuff. And you're always like, oh, she doesn't know. She's not technology, right? Think about getting thrown into a new job, right? Being a consultant, I feel like you're kind of, if, if this is how you feel, this can almost feel like masochism, right? Because you're constantly being thrown into new jobs. So that first day, how are you feeling, right? Are you feeling like, my boss is gonna realize this was a huge mistake sending me here. I totally do not belong here, right? Or maybe it's, my boss is gonna realize this was a huge mistake and I totally don't belong here, right? Thoughts you have whenever you need to succeed at a job, right? That's, that's the killer, like, hey, we're putting you on this project because it needs to go really well. Like, this needs to be a home run. And you're like, oh, geez, right? And you start thinking, well, fuck. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> maybe you'd not take it down a notch, right? And, and maybe the third one is, well, that was fun while it lasted because I am totally losing my job after this, right? Like, you know, it, I, I'm seeing enough people laughing that I have to assume that some of this resonates, right? Maybe you didn't call it that. Maybe you're like, oh, imposter syndrome. That sounds like something you need medication for, right? That is totally not me, right? It's, it's not, though. This isn't a disease, right? This isn't something that you need to be, to be cured of, right? Let, let's talk just about a couple more, and then we're going to move on, because some of these were just too good to not include, right? Things you beat yourself up for, and I know for me, as someone who does a lot of conference speaking, I am constantly beating myself up about stuff, and these are really true for me, right? So if you kind of look at that, that smallest slice, Right, things you beat yourself up for. Stuff completely out of your control, right? Like it was too cold in the room, the projection system didn't work, I don't know, we're getting a lot of feedback on the mic, stuff that you really you can't do anything about. We look at that slightly bigger piece. Stuff everyone else has literally already forgotten about. This happens to be all the time where I'm like, yeah, I remember that one talk I gave like 18 years ago on source control and I kept it, like nobody remembers that but you, right? But you'll beat yourself up because it wasn't perfect. And then the biggest one, stuff no one else even noticed, right? But it's in your little Rolodex, right, of things that you're like, oh man, that was awful. It was so bad and like no one even noticed. So how you tend to feel about yourself, right? A hot, crazy, truck fire mess of a person who disappoints important people. Right? And again, I'm not saying I feel like this all the time, but this definitely crops up, right? It's one of those things that kind of comes up and nags at me. And, and really the reality of this is that everybody thinks you're just cool and fine, right? You're, you're the one, you've kind of internalized this and you're feeling it. And, and you might be going like, hey, I don't understand. Like, why are you guys, why are you even saying this? You're up there giving this talk, right? Clearly you don't have issues with confidence and blah, blah, blah. Anyone who knows me can tell you that is, Totally not true, and I was panicking about this talk until the minute I got up here, because I'm so afraid that I'm gonna disappoint you guys. Hopefully I've not so far. <laughs> so, types of people who can have imposter syndrome? Literally anybody in this room, right? It could be anybody. I used to think, well, it must be just certain people in certain types of roles or, or you know, things like that. So those, those four statements that I talked about earlier, disappointing people, I never do things good enough, that was actually came from a test, again, super scientific test, um, but it was still interesting. And so I was really curious, because I'm like, well, how bad is my imposter syndrome? You know, like, so I took the test, there was something like 40 questions. If you're interested, I actually have a link to it. 
in the, the presentation that you guys can grab if, if you want to take it and see how you do. Um, and, and so I'm all about grades. Like, hey, how did I do? Did I get an A? I don't know what that means. Is a high score good? Um, and so I took the test, and it essentially kind of broke down to a certain, uh, certain ranges, right? Um, and essentially 61 to 80 was the second to highest bucket, right? And it was respondent, you know, the people frequently have imposter syndromes. They weren't quite in the top notch, um, but they were close, right? And I took the score, and I got a 77, and I'm like, I don't know, how is that? That's like a C, right, on the grading scale, I don't know. Um, but then I was really curious, because I was like, well, how does that stack up against how the people that I know have scored, right? And so I sent it around, put it on Facebook, put it on Twitter. Um, I had a lot more responses than this, but I just got lazy and didn't feel like putting more stuff on the slide. But it essentially came down to like, most of the people I know had struggled with it, right? So then I, then I could, could honestly say like, I don't feel alone anymore, right? This isn't something that I struggle with alone. And, and something else that was interesting is, it ranged all careers, it ranged ages, genders, like the bold ones are women, the non-bold ones are men. I didn't really find any pattern, right? It, it seemed to be pretty pervasive. And it was really interesting because just sending the, the quiz out, you know, I said, hey, I won't use your name, so I'm not gonna share any of that information. And I started getting messages from people saying like, just taking that quiz turned my stomach. It made me so nervous and it made me anxious because it started making me remember things like about work, right? Situations that had been bad. And, and I have to say, like, the same thing happened to me. You know, I started taking this quiz, and I started kind of thinking about, thinking back to things, um, and I started to realize it's not necessarily just internal either, right? Some of this is actually happening because of the environments we're in or because of the people that we work with. And so specifically, I think about things like, you know, when I did work at Microsoft, I think because there were certain expectations that you literally did know everything. You'd go to a client, Right, they'd start peppering you with questions. I wouldn't necessarily know all the answers because I'm not like you know I'm not Wikipedia here. Um, and every once in a while, I would get that bad feedback. Right, like oh, don't bring Angela back; she doesn't know anything. And I'm like, I spent three hours answering questions until I finally ran out of stuff that I could tell you. Um, but those are the types of things that start to kind of trigger it in people. Right, not everyone is going to internalize things. But that's part of the reason I bring it up. When I first started talking about imposter syndrome, I think it was about a year and a half ago, I kind of mostly focused internally, right? Like, how do we see it in ourselves and how do we not fix it, right? Because again, I don't think it's something you need to fix, but how do we internally kind of deal with it and handle it? And then I started to realize it's just as much about the people around us, right? And, and how you can kind of recognize how it affects people. And the, the reason this is a big deal it's because I started looking up actual scientific stats, um, and I have some, some references in here if you're curious. There's some actual stats on this, right, where they've kind of talked to people and just said, hey, how often are you feeling these things? Um, and, you know, I think about even my last DevOps days. So last year was my first year here, um, and I remember, I remember walking in and feeling like, okay, I haven't really written code in a while. I'm really more of kind of a process person right now. Like I do agile coaching, I do, I do like, if I do any kind of implementation stuff, it's with TFS and no one here is talking about this stuff. And I just felt like, who the heck am I? Like why would anyone want me even here? I felt like I did not belong. Um, and yet I started sitting through the talks and I was like, holy cow, these talks are absolutely, they're about culture and they're not just about, you know, uh, all the DevOps tools and, and, and things I don't necessarily understand. And, and I remember when the open spaces thing came up, I was like, huh, I've given this imposter syndrome talk like once. Maybe I'll do it as an open space, because that's less intimidating, right? That's no, not too bad. Like, probably no one will show up, so it'll be fine. Uh, <laughs> that's always my thought. No one will show up. It'll be fine. Uh, so, I, so I pitched the open space, and, and it got accepted, and I was like, oh, crap. Now I actually have to do it. Right, and so I was like, that's fine. That's right. Not many people are gonna show up because there's a lot of other really good ones. No one will come to mine. And we ran out of chairs. I was so overwhelmed. I was like, I, I assumed that I was gonna come to the DevOps conference and everyone's just gonna be like, we're totally confident. Everybody knows exactly what they're doing because I think that's the assumption I take with me everywhere I go, right? Like, if you think about a bubble of what everybody knows, I always feel like, I'm like way over here with this tiny little bubble 
and everyone else in the world has got this huge bubble over here, nowhere related to mine, and I couldn't possibly have anything to offer. And having that experience last year was pretty amazing. And it's backed up by the stats, which is that, you know, from what people are seeing, right, there's no exact numbers, and people argue left and right as to what the reality is here, but up to 70% of people have felt these effects. And if you think about what you saw on those slides, think about how stifling those effects could be, right? You could have, if, if you think about 70% of your people, if you have 10 people on your team, there's a good chance that, you know, seven of the 10 people at some point while you're working on a project, while you're sitting in meetings, maybe while you're out having lunch, have felt like they're not enough to really be able to contribute. They don't feel like they're worthy of, of speaking up and kind of sharing their opinions. And that can be kind of a scary thing, right? This, the, the whole point, right? One of my favorite things that comes out of the, has come out of these DevOps conferences is it's all about collaboration and how do we improve and how do we work together to build on each other's strengths. But that kind of assumes that everyone is openly sharing, right? And that everyone is willing to participate and bring everything that they know to the table. They're not afraid of disappointing people. They're not afraid of having negative feedback if they say the wrong thing, or if they throw out a crazy idea that maybe really isn't so crazy, but it just doesn't align with what people want to work on. And then you think about IT in general, right? And I mean, I think about, <laughs> I think about when I started back in you know, the early 90s, right back in college, I was doing mainframe stuff. I wasn't even doing client server. And I think about how much things have changed since then, and I feel like it just keeps expanding faster and faster every single year. You think about the new types of tools that come up, the new processes that come up. Like, you know, several years ago, if someone would have described a container to me, and I would have been like, that, I, what? That's not even a thing. Like, you can't do that. Like, you think about the amazing things that we can do, but you think about how much you really need to grasp sometimes to understand those big pictures. It can be pretty, it can be pretty daunting, right? <clears throat> and then you start to wonder, like, how can you not make mistakes, right? And I feel like it's kind of a good segue from the first few speakers that we've had, because everybody's brought that up. Like, you're going to make mistakes, right? It's not going to be perfect. All that really matters is that you're working, you're learning, and you're trying to get better, right? And who's going to argue with this guy, right? Yeah, I follow Neil deGrasse Tyson on Twitter. <laughs> but this was brilliant, right? If you never make mistakes then you're not on the frontier of discovery, for that is where mistakes are made all the time, right? We really only get those amazing solutions when we do crazy stuff and it either doesn't work and we're like, well, we're not doing that again, or we go, you know, that didn't work, but maybe if we do this other thing, right, we'll have this awesome solution. But you need to be in an environment where people feel like they can actually make those mistakes, right? And, and the biggest kind of, I think, crippler there is, is absolutely fear, right? Fear can be pervasive. Not everyone feels imposter syndrome levels of fear, but it's absolutely something that you might notice on your teams, right? As an agile coach, that's absolutely something I have to look for, right? If I see that something is not working on a team, sometimes it's, well, I can see the, the issue is we have a couple people on the team that don't feel like they can contribute, and you have to kind of dig into that and figure out what is it, right? Is it the culture? Is it maybe, I like to say PTSD from a previous client or a previous team, right, where they don't feel like they can share, they don't feel like they, they can take risks. So yeah, fear is absolutely pervasive in IT, and it will kill collaboration every time, right? How can you really truly be collaborative if people are afraid to take those risks and if they're afraid to kind of open up and sometimes be vulnerable, right? I feel like that's a, that just makes me feel weird to say that word. Right? You think about, like, I have to possibly put myself out there and say something that might be perceived as dumb or brilliant. Right? You have to be you know, not only willing to do that, but have a team that will support you in doing that. Think about anything that we talked about, trying out new tools, trying out new processes, right? Ad ad adopting you know, Scrum on the team. One of the things about it is, man, it starts to shine a light on dysfunction so fast. You start finding out, like, are there people on the team who discourage people from taking risks? Right? Are there people who, you know, maybe inadvertently discourage people from making mistakes by calling them out in meetings or just joking, right? I get that all the time, like, oh, that was so dumb, right? And they're totally kidding, but other people on the team might see that and go, yeah, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want that guy making fun of me, right? So you, you have to start thinking about those types of things. So the talk isn't really about necessarily your own imposter syndrome. It's also about looking at your team and making sure you're recognizing it in others. 
because again, it can kill all of these amazing plans that, that you can make in terms of how to improve and, and how to change things within your culture. Some of you guys may remember this. This was actually uh, kind of a pretty big deal, not just on Twitter. Obviously, I spent a lot of time on Twitter. Um, but you know, it's been a big thing in the open source community as well, right? People do something like, you know, they do a pull request into some GitHub project and then someone tears them a new ass because they're new, right? They don't know, maybe this is the first time they've ever done it and they were all stoked and they were pumped and they have great ideas, but it wasn't the, the most elegant solution and someone literally just quashed their, their passion to do this. It, maybe they're not gonna do it anymore, right? And it's easy to be that person that goes, oh, I worked so hard and you just screwed something up. Did we really not all do that at some point? I mean, I think about myself that my first year out of college, I thought I knew everything, right? Right, my classic ASP and my VB6 com, like, yeah, that was, I'm sure if I look back at that stuff, it was so awful. But I thought that I was amazing and I knew everything. It was almost like I didn't know enough to know that I didn't know anything, right? And so you have to kind of be empathetic to the people who are new to the community because you're setting the stage for them, right? For how they interact with others as well. You know, so what are we all, what are we so afraid of? Right, we're afraid of making mistakes. We're afraid of having the wrong answer, right? We're afraid of people calling us out, humiliating us, making us, making us feel you know, bad about not being perfect. So we also have to be careful that we're not stoking the fires for other people. So I think this might actually be my last Twitter thing, because <laughs> again, I, I love this one. I thought this one was so good, um, is that often, we tend to forget about the people who are watching us as well, right? Because whether or not you realize it, people are watching you, right? New guys on the team, interns, other people, right? They're kind of watching you going, okay, so that's what we do when someone screws up. That's what we do when people have good ideas. You also have to think about how you're setting examples, right? And, um, and honestly, one of the things I normally go to, and, and I cut it, and now I'm kind of regretting cutting it, so I'm just gonna talk about it, is so there's another conference that I work at called That Conference and we have a kids track. And I think about how amazing it is that we had something like 13 or 14 girls under the age of 14 teaching classes at that conference, right? They haven't even learned, right, that girls don't do IT or things like that. Like no one has said those things to them yet. It doesn't happen that often, but it only needs to happen once for someone to kind of go, okay, maybe this isn't what I should be doing. And I think about the fact that they've always had such great examples, right? They come to this conference every year, they get this great experience, right? We give them, we give them applause, we, we encourage them, and then they come back the next year and they keep doing it, right? And so even if you don't think about your coworkers, think about your kids, your friends' kids, like we, we also wanna make sure we're setting a good example for them as well. So that's giving us an opportunity, right, to kind of be heroes, right? Be good examples, set a good stage, make sure that you're welcoming new people to the team, and helping people understand how they should act, how they should treat each other, right? And help them kind of, you know, channel their powers for good, right? So I feel like this is kind of harkening back to, to the first talk, right? So be a beginner, be okay with other people being a beginner and not always knowing all the answers, right? Be fearless, right? <laughs> Don't be afraid to share things, right? And if you get a response that isn't an appropriate one, don't let that stuff slide, right? Don't let, don't let that slide with if you see someone else doing it as well, right? Say, hey, come on, we all screw up. This is how we learn. Be passionate, right? The whole, again, the whole idea of discovery is we have to have that passion. And at least for me, I feel like my imposter syndrome, I kind of use it to fuel my passion. I always feel like, well, I don't wanna walk in the room and, and disappoint. I'm never gonna know everything, but I'm gonna work as hard as I can to learn the relevant things and it pushes me where other people might just give up, right? And so for me, I actually see it as a positive thing, but I do have to be careful to make sure that it doesn't overwhelm me, right? And, and, and last but not least, right, if you're gonna be anything, right, be excellent to each other. That's the lesson here, right? It's all about making sure that we're being awesome to our team members, that we're fostering collaboration, and that we're doing the things that will really help our teams to thrive and improve and grow. And that's it. So, thank you. <laughs>